I'm up in uh, our woods and I have a special guest star today. Hello! Kate Clark from Radio Gloucestershire. And we're going to do, well, let, let, let Kate tell us what you're going to do. We're going to have a look at the Bluebells, and that's about all I know. This is some land owned by Richard. And, or the family, um, anyway. The family. Yeah, Whoops. right. And um, we're going to go and find out how many Bluebells are here, how good quality they are, and a little bit of social history. So stay tuned. I'm going to put on some pictures over the broadcast that we're going to do, and I uh, hope you enjoy watching it or listening to it. We're also chatting about bluebells as well on the programme today and the best place to see them in Gloucestershire. I have my spot. Oh yeah, I have my go-to spot for bluebells in the Forest of Dean, which it just never, ever fails me. And I'll tell you about it very soon. Now, do you remember the funky farmer who used to pop up on the show a couple of years ago? Well, he's back. It's Richard Cornock. That's his real name. And he's a dairy farmer in Titherington. I went to meet Richard last month to walk through a strip of woodland covered in bluebells. Here is Richard reminding us of his YouTube channel. I run the farm with my brother Tom and we milk about 70 cows. We are a really small scale little farm um, and we also do uh, kind of conservation work and stuff like that but also I do the YouTube channel The Funky Farmer and actually do you know I forgot to tell you this I was on Points West you know BBC Points West I was on there back at Christmas time doing a little bit dance to Shaking Stevenson on top of my <laughs> tractor with tinsel so that might be the last time some of your listeners saw me and how many subscribers have you got nowadays Ooh, about 45,000 or something yeah. if anyone goes on there they can see um, what I do on the farm that's what I do I film film I'm, I'm trying to be honest farming not kind of this new kind of showy stuff I've got old trailers old kit and it's just me mucking around with a few cows and doing things like and that. you try and do what one a week yeah one, one or two a week uh, a bit of a variety of mixture I've got my kids on there come on the farm and do a few bits and pieces so there's all sorts of milk in the cows I try and do seasons as well so I might do a little video about the bluebell woods we're just walking through and uh, yeah it's I like it because I get interaction from other people because and anyone who works in a job like farm will know about this. It's quite a lonely job in the fact that a lot of the time you're on your own. We've just seen a guy on a tractor out there. Now, the, do you know one of the bis biggest lifesavers for me on the farm is having the radio on, Radio Gloucestershire, listening to you, your voice or whatever. When I'm on in a field in the middle of nowhere, it's nice to feel there's someone else around. Yeah. Well, your latest video has been the cows released oh, into yeah. pasture. So this is really late, isn't it, for you to release oh. the cows? It's been an incredibly late spring. I, mean, I know you probably heard people, farmers banging on about this for ages, but the impact on us is... I normally think to get our cows out of the barn, because we keep them in for winter, I normally think to let them out about the first week of April. Latest up until uh, this year, it was the 9th of April I'd let them out, but it was actually this year was the, the 19th of April, which you might think, well, what's the big deal like that? But actually, it's quite a difficult thing because you, you're inside, they're eating all your food, but also you're having to buy in straw. The price of straw has gone through the roof because it's such a, you know everyone wants it and there's quite a shortage. But also, I tell you what, you know, if you're running a marathon, when you get to that last bit of the marathon, you just want it to finish. You just had enough. Keeping cows in all winter is you start off in about November and it's like it's a little slow jog. You get to about January and it's like, oh, this is slogging on a bit. I get to April and I am, I've had enough of cleaning out cows and feeding them. I just want to let them go and they want to go. So why haven't you been able to release them beforehand? Well, with the, all this cold weather, the grass didn't get going. It was just, it just didn't want to grow. And when the cold spell kind of went and the grass started to grow, it, it was so wet that if I'd let the cows out into the field, they would have just destroyed the pasture. They would have just churned it up. A bit like a rugby field in the middle of winter, it just becomes a bog. So I didn't let the cows out two weeks because of the rain. And that, now they're out, it's like, whew. Did they do a little, like, they jump and... They did, and they, did they did do a skip. They love, a cow skip is nothing like it. Because the cows, they weigh 600 kg, so to, 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 for them to skip off the ground, that takes some doing, I'll tell you what. They did skip. Well, let's walk uh, let's back down, down the blue belt road. Kate, let's come on. Here. Now, you mentioned we've just seen a farmer. He's ploughing up that field over there. What are farmers doing at this time of year now? Well, for, I'm sure a lot of the um, arable farmers now are probably starting to put in things like spring barley because normally that's planted by now. But it, because it's been so wet, they've been unable to um, get the machinery into the field. So there'll be a lot of um, planting. Oh, they'll be going mad, actually. They're drilling and planting and ploughing and everything all over the place. Some guys would be putting fertilizer on, keep the grass going. And uh, for us, it'd be just a case of getting the stock out and um, hoping we get a good silage crop in end of May, I think. Last time we spoke to you, or maybe it was the time before, 
we talked about your wildflower meadow. Oh, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. So yes. are you still planting wildflower seeds? Well, I haven't planted any more, but I've got an interesting... Because it's an ongoing project, I found I've got a little bit of a problem with it. I discovered that in amongst the mix of wildflower seeds I put in was a plant called yellow rattle. It looks quite nice, and it does look like a baby's rattle, lots of little seed pods on it. The problem with it is it's, it's a plant that sucks all the nutrients out of the ground, and it inhibits the grass growth, yeah. which doesn't work very well for me, considering I'm trying to grow a hay crop there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm not actually going to make a hay crop and leave it to go seed this year. I'm going to try and graze it because it's an annual uh, flower, and I'm hoping that if the cattle graze it, it won't seed, and then I'll get rid of it. Because I'm quite worried, actually. You know, it's interesting. Conservation isn't as straightforward as you think. And I'm learning as I go with this field as much as, as anyone else, really. I am going to try and graze that one out, you know. But um, it's, still, it's still an ongoing project. It's a nice project because you've seen it gradually evolve over time. And uh, hopefully it will be an, a really good sort of biodiversity habitat. And also you'll get a lot of things like bees and, you know, pol other pollinators on it, really. Well, the bluebell woods that we're just walking Lovely. through here, absolutely gorgeous. They're beautiful. It's just gonna. It's just a short window, isn't it? Of what? How many weeks do you think they'll last? Well, I think they they haven't peaked yet. If we look, if we just look at one of the bluebells, you can see the tops of them haven't come out yet. Yeah. And we've got another probably week or so. Anyone wants to go out and see a bluebell wood needs to get out and go and go for it. Really, I think. And we're just walking now through the uh, the blackthorn or hawthorn. Black, that's blackthorn. I this think. is blackthorn. Yeah. Is it? And uh, that's uh, blossoming. Really spikes on it as yeah, well. Yeah, they? Very invasive blackthorn. If you plant that somewhere, it will gradually creep out from the hedge. Because I have a problem with it in some of the fields, in the fact that they send up suckers, and then gradually the hedge will just come out and out and out. Right, just back through this very squeaky gate. You can smell that lovely oh. earthy smell. Yeah, well, and that's manure cake as well. <laughs> I think he's had his muck spreader out here as well. And look, straight away the birds are on it, yeah, aren't they? Are they going for the worms that have just yeah, been upturned? Yeah, they will be. Worms, yeah, leather jackets and things like that coming up. But I wouldn't be surprised if you came out here within a couple of days and that would be cultivated and they'll be drilling. I, either maize, I, I thought maize might go into there. But, it, you know, everyone's sort of a case of crack on now because we haven't got a lot of time. That was Richard Cornock, otherwise known as The Funky Farmer, on his YouTube channel, and he's a dairy farmer in Titherington. You can find him on YouTube, just search for The Funky Farmer, and later you're going to hear about marking a project with a date of completion. There is a style that he worked on with his father that he put his name to and dated, and it just then is going to go down in history. Do you do that? That's something that my husband always does. If he makes something and that's going to be hidden away, he writes his initials on it and dates it just to prove, yeah, that he got the job done. Now, coming up very soon, we're going to hear more from uh, Richard Cornog. Kate Clark, BBC Radio Gloucestershire. Mm. Diana Ross. And uh, do you know, it's BBC Radio Gloucestershire. Hello, a very good morning to you. It's Kate Clark with you here, and it's 24 minutes away from 11 o'clock. So very soon we're going to be hearing about the author Sarah Franklin, who's a contemporary author, and she set her first novel in the Forest of Dean during the Second World War. So we'll be hearing about lumberjills, prisoners of war, about how women were doing men's work, managing the forest and felling trees, and also hearing about the German and Italian prisoners of war in the forest to do that set to come before 11 o'clock this morning. So back now, talking to the Funky Farmer, whose real name is Richard Cornock, but he calls himself the Funky Farmer because uh, he's got a YouTube channel with thousands of subscribers who tune in every day uh, just to uh, take a look at what it's like working on a dairy farm. He's got 70 cows and he's a keen enthusiast for nature and the countryside. Well, I met up with Richard a couple of weeks ago now uh, to walk through a strip of woodland covered in bluebells. But before we enter the woodland, there is a style with a bit of history. Just walked through a farmer's field and uh, here we are entering some woodland and we've just swung our leg over this beautiful old stone stile. It's lovely isn't it? I, um, I do love the way that some of the stones are worn quite smooth where people have put their feet over them for years and 
It's got a couple of dates on it. I think when we just walked up here, you mentioned to me you saw one date, but I'm going to talk to you about the first date, which you can't really see unless you yeah. know. As a boy, I was, my dad showed me this. Now, you need to stand sideways on like this, and it says, Ask Use, June 1939 on that cement there. 1939. Who was Ask Use? Well, I, I remember him. He used to live along the road um, here. I and mean, when I was a lad, he was quite an old boy, but obviously he was young when he did that. But I always think it's incredible because when that was done, that was just before World War II. And you can imagine here in the June day in 1939, not thinking that all that devastation was in front of you. And here we are now in a bluebell wood, so tranquil and nice yet, mm. how things can change in a few months. If we move over, the second date that I put on here with my dad for 2011, that myself and my dad um, came up here and did a further restoration on this style because it all started to crumble and fall. And we wanted to keep it because it's a, such a lovely landscape feature. So myself and my dad came up here, we moved some stones around, re-cemented it. And I always like to leave a date somewhere because it's always nice. I think it's quite nice for walkers and stuff when they're going to somewhere where they can see. And it says W and R Cornock, April 2011. And uh, my, my dad passed away a couple of years ago, but I've always got that lovely memory of me and him up here lifting the stones and you know doing our bit to keep this stone style going and it's nice to see a good old-fashioned stone style like this because so often mm. now they're the wooden ones i suppose they're they're much cheaper to to make when we get to the other side of this world we'll have a look at the other style that is in real need of repair and that is one of my on my tick list of jobs i want to do is to um, restore the other one and do it with your two sons. Well, that, my son Jack, who's only nine, has already said, I'll do it with your dad. Aww. And that's lovely, isn't it? You know, pass the memory on, if you like. So. And then it'll say J and R. It will. <laughs> 2018. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to do it that quick. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's walk on. If we look over to our left, we have just got a carpet of violet bluebells. Isn't that fab? It's, yeah, this is a lovely spot. Should we walk on up the path here? Can you see? It's, it's actually on a public footpath, and you can see here the windy little lane or, or footpath that everyone's worn as they go up. I do know a few flowers. I'm not particularly an expert, but there's celandines, the yellow one. And we should see some anemones in a minute, the white ones. There we go. There's one down oh, there. Oh, like woodland there. anemones. Yeah. Gorgeous. So we've got a little bit of a mix here. Have you got any wild garlic, do you know? There is some. In fact, I think we're going to go, we'll go over the other side of this brow to the neighbouring field later. And that's where the wild garlic is. We should be able to smell it over there. It's always a lovely smell, isn't it? I make amazing wild garlic and potato soup. Really? I've got some waiting for me at home. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. If you want to go for a sort of, you know, clear your head or something, sometimes you've had a bad day or something, a little walk in a wood. It's very tranquil and relaxing. Isn't it? it is. And if you creep along slowly and quietly enough you get to see wildlife you hopefully do. not just yeah. the birds well i've seen deer up here actually quite often they come through but also you just listen to the birds singing yeah. isn't that lovely so this is your woodland in terms of a land owner are you under any strict guidance as to what you should mm. be doing with it I don't think I'd be allowed to come over with a bulldozer. <laughs> um, to be honest, we've kind of left this small piece, because you can see it's only a small strip. We, Our finish is when we get to the end of there. We haven't really ever done much with it, other than my mother and father have come up and cut bean sticks. In fact, here we are. These are hazel. They make lovely bean sticks, and or pea sticks. The smaller ones, one's a bit thicker than that, like that one there. If you cut that and you get a load of them, you can grow your peas up it. Mm. Especially if you leave the greenery at the top, so the the peas can tangle around the top. But the thicker ones like that can get them. I guess people always did this before um, they could go to the garden centre and buy bamboo canes. Yeah. If you go and cut your hazel sticks, that's the perfect stick for putting in the ground and growing a run of bean up. So always as a kid, we used to come up here on on an evening with my mum and dad. My dad would be there cutting down his bean sticks. And a few years ago, I was in a village shop and someone said. Oh, your footpath's blocked off, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and I didn't know that. <laughs> so I went, I came up here, because, you know, in the wintertime, I don't really come up here. I came up and this huge tree had gone right across the um, footpath and everyone was having to walk around the field. And of course, it was really muddy and they weren't too happy. So in the end, I had to clear the ash tree. And then once it cleared, there was left a massive opening in the canopy, so which is why we put those trees in that spot yeah. to fill the canopy gap. But um, other than that, we pretty well leave it to itself because... 
it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter if it's left to go wild i'm not trying to get a commercial wood out of it how lovely is it to be up here you see that depression in the wood there that is actually or in the ground there that is actually remains an old quarry oh my goodness yeah in Titherington, it's quite well known for its quarrying because the, the the stone is very c uh, near the surface. So if you need a bit of stone for your garden, or for yeah, that style, you that's know. That's right. Well, we're going to see the remains of the old the style. style. So we saw the one that myself and my father restored seven years ago. Now we're going to see the one that needs a bit of work. Kate, have you brought your cement mixer with you? <laughs> hey? Sadly not. Here's the other one. That's a lovely big old stone. So this slab. is Titherington stone. Yeah. Is it? And what sort of colour is Titherington stone usually yeah. when it comes out the ground? Cool. Well, I'll cut that in half and find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of a grey colour. It's not like the Cotswold stone, you know, the yellowy colour. It's more of a grey colour. But you can see here, what we've got is a massive slab put on its side to climb over. And then what they've done, they've built up around either side to secure it. But on the right hand side, there should be a sort of pillar area there. And that has actually fallen down. But my plan is actually at some point is to um, do some work on this. I don't know whether I'll do it myself or whether I have to get someone to help me do it. When my father and me walked away from that style when we'd done it, it was a lovely feeling. I guess it, this is the thing about it's not just doing the style. It's for any of your listeners if they're doing something, whether you've made a cake or grown some runner beans or done something yourself. When, you've, when you stick back and look at it and go... I did that. It's a lovely feeling, isn't it? Great sense of achievement. And with something like this, it's going to last another couple of hundred yeah, years. Yeah, I, I certainly intend to do this in my lifetime. And I want it to remain there for another few hundred years, at least. And someone else's job then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else do that? Put their name on something once you've made it. Once you've made it and it's there then in history, put your name on, draw it on, scratch it on or write it in the wet cement as uh, Richard did there. And then it's just there forever. Is it, is it a bit too sentimental for you? What have you written your name on? Come on, I know that my husband and his dad, when they were putting the shed together, they put their initials on the roof underneath the felt and put the date on. And then when you're dismantling things and you come across it, you're like, oh, was it really that long ago? Because you find the date on there. That was the funky farmer you just heard. Richard Cornock is his real name and he's a dairy farmer in Titlington. You can find him on YouTube. Search for the funky farmer. And um, one of his videos he's uploaded recently is about muck spreading, which I'm sure the boys will love. And another one is when the cows were released for the first time, which was very late this year, the 19th of April, he said, and they were skipping. He says these cows were skipping and jumping around as they were released into pasture. The County's Guide on BBC Radio Gloucestershire.